A very warm welcome to those who are joining us now from live streaming. It's wonderful because we have brothers and sisters right across this country and beyond. Um, hello to those in Juni. Hello to Ralph and Geraldton. And I could mention many other cities and destinations where faithful people are. It's a privilege to be able to meet together. I want to talk today about hope. I want to talk about hope because it's very important. I wake up, up every day and I have meaning, purpose, identity and hope. I know my Redeemer lives. And I want to share that hope with us because I spent many years wrestling the subject. In 2007 I started writing a book about resurrection. That one day Jesus will call your name and my name from the grave. That the physical life that we have now is not all that there is. And so, you know, you are no accident. You are loved. We are loved. And I want us to leave today understanding that hope is not just a little subject, one of those nice sort of things that Christians talk about to feel good. Hope is very deep. I've wrestled this subject for the last... Month, since 2007, but in the last month or so in preparing for this message, that life has transcended meaning, whereas in this society we have a whole new generation of people growing up with no hope. When I was in high school in the 1970s, we learned about the theory of evolution. We were still sympathetic Christians or culturally Christian. But now we discredit anything Christian in our politics and our media and in our news. And we basically tell our children that you evolved and it's foolish to believe a higher purpose. So the subject of hope is not trivial because there's an onslaught telling our children that there is no hope, that there is no moral higher arbiter. I have evolutionary friends who cannot answer what or who is the arbiter of morality and truth. Is it those who have most power and the most guns? Who arbitrates that? You know, to tell our children that you are a conscious blip between two oblivions, that life really has no meaning, you're just another evolutionary animal. And evolutionary animals, according to Darwin, is the survival of the fittest. So if I can rob and steal and rape, then that's within my entitled survival mechanism. And you and I think, well, that's not really like that, is it? Well, if you study tribalism at its worst, where there's no morality, it's frightening. One of the things that atheism cannot give is atheism cannot give hope. But one day, death is only the result, the universe will expand, it'll all come to an end. And this is a challenging because we used to laugh about this in the 60s and 70s. Oh, these crazy scientists saying we evolved. But today it's mainstream education. And you look at your high school children's narrative books and they're all like that. And so many university students have reported, I was talking in Adelaide with some of the brethren there, some of their children go to university. And they were saying, the teacher gets up at the beginning of the year and says, how many people believe in God? And one or two people put their hands up and he says, I'm here to tell you that God doesn't exist. And that's the beginning of the class. And of course, that's a younger person is not morally or linguistically or academically inclined to be able to rebut that. And after four or five years of that, they walk out confused. In other words, there's a great lie being propagated. You are created in God's image and likeness. But if you can say that you are created in the animal kingdom with no purpose, we're just an accident, um, have you ever wondered why in the last few decades there's been an extraordinary rise in suicide? Because there's no hope, there's no moral accountability, there's no answer. What about a rise in tyranny and entitlement? And what about mental health issues? I went to Answers in Genesis doing a bit of background searches to understand the danger of living without hope and the dangers our youth face um, with this onslaught of the devil's lie. Let me read what um, um, Answers in Genesis talked about world religion and atheism. Um, atheism ath does atheism offer a sense of purpose for our short lives? To put it simply, no it doesn't. You see, in an atheistic worldview, it doesn't matter how we live or what we do because ultimately there's no standard for right and wrong because everyone's fate is the same death. In this view, there can be no right and no wrong. Since there is no God, 
there is no ultimate foundation for morality. So who decides what is good and evil? Is it the individual? Is it the society? A specific government? Or whoever has the most power or the biggest guns? In the atheistic view, we are simply animals doing what animals do. Animals kill, steal, abandon their offspring, practice promiscuity, and generally speaking, just look out for themselves. If we are just animals, then these things can't possibly be wrong for us any more than it's wrong for an animal to do. So in this view, why does it matter what we do? Nothing is wrong, nothing is right. Why not just live however we want to do and please whatever we want to do? Because that's essentially the message of atheism. Atheism offers no purpose in life because no matter how you live or what you do, your fate's the same. Now you and I have been called by God, the Father to Jesus Christ, and given the Holy Spirit to understand the transcendent reality that you are not orphans, cosmic orphans. We are children of God in a very powerful way. And that the moral law espoused in the Ten Commandments is a law of love. And God's law is righteous and true, and we have hope. This God who creates us is, I have a purpose for you. I have a plan for you. You are the clay model. But in accepting Jesus and his righteousness and repenting of your sins, I'm going to elevate you to live forever in power and might and glory. And this authentic hope defines us. Because when you get up, the moment you know that you lie, you just haven't broken a, a um, societal norm that's probably not a good thing to lie, but if you can get away with it, it's okay because you've saved your bacon. But you know that you're answerable to the one who defines morality, though shall not bear false witness. So you begin to submit to the law of God and find, and then you realise that this is a, um, a stamp of Christ and you're brought to Christ. And you, authentic hope, that one day Jesus will call your name from the grave is transformational. You change your behaviour. You change your attitude. There is a higher arbiter and we stand on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Today I have some scriptures and I want to bring those in encouraging scriptures to us and I've highlighted in yellow some of the words that stand out. And um, Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have hope and we have hope in God's word, we have hope in Christ, we have hope in resurrection, we have hope. And what we do, we hold fast to it. Because otherwise the lie will... Why would we hold fast to it? Because the devil is a deceiver and Jesus says, take heed that no one deceive you. Verse 19, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor for the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. In other words, you can go to your heavenly father. This direct access to the father was once the role of the high priest and Jesus' sacrifice opened that way so we can enter the holy holy. This topic of hope is more comprehensive than we might give it face value because God makes certain promises and we cling to those promises. We really hold on dear. If you turn to John chapter 6, in five places you'll see, sorry, four places you'll see, Jesus says, I will raise him up at the last day. I will raise him up at the last day. Don't, you know, John chapter 5. Don't be amazed at this. The time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done evil to a resurrection, those who have done good to a resurrection of life and those who have done evil to a resurrection of judgment. Now, then in chapter 6, John Jesus four times says, I will raise you up long after you've died and lied in the dust of the ground. I will call your name from the grave. And suddenly you realise there's a hope in something that you... Now hope is really wanting something to happen. Faith is believing that it'll happen. I can hope it's going to be sunshine tomorrow or rainy tomorrow or I hope I have good health when I'm in my 80s. But that's pr predicated on uncertainty of a lot of other things. But I really want to 
live forever and I really want to hear Jesus call my name and faith is believing that it will happen. So you can see how hope and faith work together. It's very powerful. Um, this is where it comes out in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You know the love chapter? It's something we read at a wedding. It's really beautiful. Verse 13 of chapter 13. So now faith, hope and love abide. Paul is saying those are the three greatest attributes that we can have. But out of these three, the greatest of these is love. Now we love, we've, we've talked about love and the different types of Greek, four different Greek words for love. And, and we've talked a lot about faith in the past. But you see, Paul puts faith, hope and love as three of the greatest virtues that can embody us as followers of Jesus Christ. And, but he, uh, and he says, yes, love, the sacrificial love, and we understand that. But hope fits into that. And you can say, well, what's the difference between faith and hope? Well, hope is believing something will happen. Hope is desiring something to happen that's being promised to you. And faith is believing that it will happen. Very powerful. Um, how does faith and hope equate with transcendent aspiration? Because we really, really believe. You listen to the promises of God. See, a small child, Jesus said, unless you become like little children, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Mummy says to little Johnny, on Sunday we'll go to the park and we'll buy you an ice cream. Well, he has no reason to dis dispute his parents. And of course, his parents' credibility says, oh, we're not going to the park and we're not buying an ice cream. And the little Johnny will fall apart because you really believe your parents. And Jesus, I want you to believe me, even for the sake of the miracles themselves, to believe me. And we desperately hope for this reality. And it's not a hope based on fanciful thinking. It's a based on reason and the work of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things in reading up about hope from various sources is that hope produces a resilience, a really strong resilience. If you read articles about hope, you always see resilience in there. People who have hope are more resilient. They've seen that on the operating table and the, the medically sick in hospital. Those who have a faith structure and some kind of transcendent hope are much easier to deal with and often heal better. Very, very interesting. Um, I have a, um, a story here that really helps illustrate that. I was going to bring it up later about how hope... Cornell University did a study about the impacts of hope on people who were incarcerated in prison and how the difference between those who died and those who survived. Um, Cornell University conducted a study on the effects of hope and reported that people with hope could endure incredible burdens. It's very interesting. One group compromised 25,000 soldiers in prison during World War II. They were subjected to forced labour, bad food, filthy conditions. Many died while others showed only slight damage. And the question was, they'd interviewed them and did studies with the survivors and they found with the survivors revealed a far above average ability to hope. How they were able to keep the hope alive. They drew pictures of their family. They looked forward to seeing their wives again. They de even designed their future homes. And they actually, some, of, some of them actually planned to what business they would do afterwards. They had some kind of hope. And if you study Changi prisons and those sort of places, you realise, I've seen the photos, emaciated men suffering extraordinary gout in arms and legs and joints because they were malnourished. And hope not only kept them well, it kept them alive. And I, I, I mention that there because hope is not trivial. It really tra transforms you. It changes your destiny. It, it allows you to, as a evidence points, to endure incredible burdens. How did Jesus go to the crucifixion willingly? He had hope that many sons would be born to glory, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, because there was glory, there was hope, there was purpose in it. Otherwise, you and I wouldn't say, oh, let me be crucified, I'll make myself available just for the sake of a big public statement. No. In the Bible, there's 151 references to hope and Psalms. I read Psalms last night, one after the other. I will hope in the Lord. I will hope in his word. I will hope in his righteousness. I will hope in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Wait on the Lord. 
I just want to bring up a few. Psalms 113. Oh, hang on. Psalms 130, verse 7. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him plentiful redemption. If you just go through the Psalms, there's dozens and dozens of hope in the Lord, and I hope in his word. And um, very encouraging. Um, Psalm 130, just a verse before that. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and on his word I hope. Wow. Let's take it a step further, reading from Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Since therefore we have been justified by faith, faith is a word, I highlighted there, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So faith and joy and peace are things that fit into the hope spectrum. Through him we've also, been gained, also obtained access by faith into his grace by which we stand. I have been forgiven. We have been forgiven. We are new creation in Christ. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God that we shall be like him as he is, just like Jesus glorified. And we have that hope. And it defines us. You know when Wade Rose lost his wife to cancer, she had 14 months of cancer, Rebecca commented how difficult it must have been. She was in bed, dying of cancer, singing hymns of praise to God. The whole church praying for her. Brother Wade said, take my life, Lord, spare my wife. Please, God, take my life, because he loved his wife. But the Lord had different plans. But she praised and sang praises to God. And Rebecca said, that must have been really hard. How do you do that? You're dying. And you can praise and say, God, I believe. Glory to you, God. I have hope in you. Verse number three. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that our suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. The idea of resilience. And hope does not put us to shame. It's not like uncertain hope. Because God's love has been poured through our hearts, through the Holy Spirit has been given us. That's the key word, through the Holy Spirit given to us. Human beings cannot believe in the transcendent. The best scientific minds without the Holy Spirit cannot believe in an almighty, personable, noble, creator God who reveals in his glory in Jesus Christ. You know, hope points to a bigger purpose in life. Let's continue in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 22. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we await eagerly for adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies. I'm growing older. My grandfather died at my age now. It, 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 it re if you don't have hope, and my grandfather did not have hope, he'd been brutalised in war, saw the atrocities of imposter Christianity, and he had no meaning in life, and he died. We worm because there's something bigger here. And in verse 24, for in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. What did Joshua read this morning about Jesus? Though you have not seen him, you love him. A capacity to believe in the transcendent reality. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We want it now. We pray, Father, thy kingdom come. Hasten God. How long, O Lord? Because there's a destiny, but there's also a journey there. And this idea of hope about the Gentiles, those who have not known God. Romans 15 verse 12, and again Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, referring to the seed of David, Jesus Christ, and even who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles will hope. You and I are not Jewish or Hebrew by birth. Most of us are Gentiles. And we recognise this Jesus. May the God of hope, 
fill you with all joy and peace. Joy and peace are fruits of hope. You have hope. By faith you believe it's going to happen and you have peace. If you receive injustice in this world, it's not going to throw you. Joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. You know, brothers and sisters, hope is only possible by the Holy Spirit. Let's go to Ephesians. Paul's writing to the church there in chapter 1, verse 18. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which you were, he called you. You know that you're a child of God. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? You are not receiving an inheritance from a grandmother who's now deceased or a parents who are deceased. On the death of Jesus, a bridge was connected you directly to the Father and he is giving you his inheritance. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 4. Since we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. It's a beautiful way to begin a letter. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Your hope is not in the riches of this earth. I've got a big bank account, lots of superannuation, fast cars and, and all this power in this earth. No. Your hope is in the riches in heaven. Of this you have heard before, the word, before in the word of the tr truth, the gospel, which has come to you, and indeed the whole world is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. So one day, we, one day, part of our lives, we dismissed the gospel, we laughed at it, we mocked at it, and the work of God was faithful, and we said, oh, there must be something in that. And slowly we came to faith, and we hold on to it. Go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 26. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God has chosen to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is being formed in you, and in you, and in you, and in me, and in you. This is so radical. Now, if you read Paul you see one hope, but different angles of looking at it. This is the hope laid up for you in heaven. Let's have a look at Colossians 1.26, 27, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we go to 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 2, hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Same hope, different ways of expressing it. Um, very powerful, very encouraging. Let's... Let's skip for a few scriptures. I'd love to show them all, but we can't today because of time. 1 Timothy 4.10 We have our hope set on the living God. Titus 3.7 To the hope of eternal life. Different ways of saying the thing, different things. Galatians 5.5 5. We ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Well, there's no more mourning or suffering or death or pain or malevolence or evil or lying or death or murder. 1 Peter 1.3 Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope, a certain hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What Jesus experienced through his death and resurrection and raised back to life is what you and I to expect on that day of visitation. Therefore, preparing your minds for action in 1 Peter 1.13 and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, one day Jesus will appear and you and I will not be fearful and, and backsliding and, and, and thinking, oh, I'm condemned by my own sinfulness. Set your hope on the mercy and the grace when Jesus appears. He is coming. One of the unique things about the Church of God Seventh Day is that we always had in our history an expectation of Jesus' return. And we knew that we might be, or our children, our grandchildren, may be the generation when Jesus returns. And so there's a calling to know the treasure and the promises offering offered to us. And what is offered to us, the devil would like to thwart and destroy. He's a deceiver. So the idea of believing, of receiving, of having hope, peace and joy and faith and living this transformed life for everything that it could be, the devil 
has on his highest agenda to make you feel like an orphan, that there is no hope. So he deceives. He doesn't want to know that humans are created in God's image and likeness. So he, he's deceived even the brightest, most intellectual minds in denying a God. Therefore, most people live today not knowing their fullest potential. They don't know who they are. You know, babies who've been adopted out may grow up in a loving family, but they always have a desire to know who they are. And they work hard in their 30s and 40s to find out their maternal parents, just for the sake of closing that. It's built into us to know who our parentage is. And when you know that you have a Heavenly Father and a Jesus who died for you and God is family, it lifts you above the mundane. Brothers and sisters, Satan is a destroyer and a deceiver. And today's message is a reminder that this hope, wanting something to happen, and the faith that believes that it will happen, is truly transformative. Because there is a spiritual battle underway. And hope in Christ, and hope is everything that we can hold on to. Final scripture for the day, Hebrews 10.23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. The author here is talking to believers under the terms of the new covenant and saying, you have hope. The confession of our hope is your testimony. You say, I believe. This is why I believe. It's not just something you shy away from. It's something that defines you. And do it without wavering. You are constant in this reality of what you desire. For he who promised is faithful. God does not lie. The devil lies. And the world is in the grip of a lie. Brothers and sisters, we have peace and joy. And that feeds into hope. And our hope, brothers and sisters, is in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have extraordinary hope. It defines us. It strengthens us. It gives us resilience. And it enables us to face advers adversarial circumstances like never before. May the God of all hope, the God of all mercy, and the God of all grace strengthen us all the more as we go through probably difficult times until the revealing of Jesus. <laughs>